go ahead and resume. All we did really go over was the fact that you learned how to solve all those different types of equations, right? And there should be graphs that go with them. And then we talked about the vertical line test, which we already know. Would this guy be a function based on the vertical line test? Mm -hmm. If you imagine a bunch of vertical lines all across it, each one of those vertical lines would only touch the graph one time, right? That's essentially, there's pages, like three pages talking about the vertical line test, but we already know how to use it, okay? So in order for me to do the domain, I'm looking at the X values. So I took this point and I kind of transferred it down to the X axis and I put that same type of end point. So solid here, solid there. I notice that this is the rightmost um, X value or rightmost part of the graph. So if I transfer that down to the um, X axis, I need to draw the same type of point, which is an open dot, okay? And this is your domain, because if you were to transfer every single point to the X axis, it would completely fill up this space with it, with a bunch of different dots, okay? So then that green line is your domain. All you need to do is just put it in the interval location, okay? So it starts here at negative one, and it stops over here at five. And then you just have to remember the association of parentheses and brackets to the different kinds of dots, okay? So we know that a solid dot means a bracket, and we now know that an open dot means a parentheses, okay? So that's the domain. Now the range is very much the same, similar type of process except now we're talking about the y values, okay? So I'm gonna use a different color, but I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna basically just take everything and squish it onto the um, y axis. So I'm not gonna go left to right because that's the way x moves, right? Doesn't x move left to right? The y axis moves up and down, doesn't it? So I've got to go with the highest Y value and the lowest Y value and then map it that way, okay? So this happens to be the highest Y value and it's already right there on the Y axis and it's got a solid dot. So I really don't need to do anything there. This is the lowest one. And if I map it to the Y axis, it should have a solid dot here. Now imagine you're like smushing the whole graph onto the Y axis. These two spots would fill up that spot. These two spots would come to the y-axis there. These two spots would come to the y-axis here. These two would come to the y-axis. See what I mean? Everything's gonna smush over, right? When that happens, it's gonna fill up this complete line with a bunch of dots, okay? In some cases, two dots right on top of each other, right? But that's okay. So then that's gonna be my range. Now, when you're doing the range, you always have, anytime you do intervals, you always have to put the lower number on the left and the bigger number on the right. So then in this case, I have to go from the bottom to the top instead of left to right, okay? So if I go with the bottom value, that's actually what, negative three? And then the top value is actually a positive three y value. Make sure you're taking the y values. Then they both have solid dots, so I should have brackets for both of those, okay? Now, I like to draw this just so that I can visually see like, you know, the domain is smushing everything onto the X axis, right? And the range is smushing everything onto the Y axis. It helps me to determine that. Some people don't have to draw that. They can just look at it and say, look, this is the leftmost X, the rightmost X, here's my interval. And they don't need to do all the, the scribbling that I'm doing all over the graph, okay? That's okay. If you can do it fast like that, that's good. It does get confusing sometimes, which is why I do this. Okay. Now, the last thing I need to do is I haven't done this middle part. It says find the function values f of negative one and f of two. And so the big question here is going to be, what information did they give me? And what information are they asking me to find? Because they give me a number, negative one, and then later they give me a number two. But what does that negative one represent? And what does the two represent? They are your X value because you're used to seeing 
y equals f of what? x, right? So you're always used to seeing an x value inside that parentheses with the f outside, right? Which means that this is the x value. So if they've given you the x values, what do you think that they're asking you to find then? Mm -hmm. So they want to know what the y value is. What is the y value that belongs to that particular x value? And if it's a function, it should only be one, right? Because it passed that vertical line test. There's only one y value. Okay, so let's go look. When x is negative one, here's when x is negative one. I have to basically scan up and down to find my graph. And I found my graph right there, right? What is that y value right there? It's a positive one y value. And then now I'm gonna go when x is two. Positive two is over here, x positive two. If I scan up, there's no graph there, but if I scan down, there is the graph, okay? And so what's this y value? Mm -hmm, negative three. So that's how you find those kinds of measurements. Now I'm gonna give you one more because I know this is happening, okay? I'm gonna do part D, I just made it up, okay? Um, try to find the X value such that F of X equals two. This one's a little bit more obvious as to which one they gave you and which one you need to find, because it literally says find the X value, doesn't it? So if you're trying to find the X value, they didn't give you the X value, did they? They gave you the Y value. Remember I told you, this is fancy notation for Y, right? And you can always replace it whenever you want. So they telling me that Y is two, they wanna know what X is, okay? So we go to our graph and we figure out where y equals two. Now there's actually how many answers here? There's one that they've pointed out to me, right? That guy over there. But in this one, I should pick the wrong y value. See what happens. If I pick three, it makes it a little bit more easy, but I am still gonna discuss what's happening with that too, okay? They're not gonna do that to you. <laughs> but if I look for the Y value three now, there's only one point that has the Y value of three, right? And what's that X value that corresponds to it? Zero. That's what they'll do to you. But let's go back and talk about when Y is equal to two. If I look when Y is equal to two here, like somewhere right there, you've got this spot right here and you've got this spot right here. Don't both of those points have a Y value of two? You have this one over here, but is there actually a point there? There's not a point there. It's an open circle, right? That means there's nothing there. It's just gonna stop before it gets there, okay? So you cannot, if for some reason they did ask you, find the X value when the Y is two, you could not say that five is gonna be one of those X values because there's an open dot there, okay? But if I knew exactly what these values were, I would be able to tell them. But I don't know because this is negative one and it's a little bit to the left of negative one, isn't it? Or I'm sorry, longer. <laughs> to the right of negative one, isn't it? Okay, and I don't know what it is exactly. I could guess, but I don't know exactly, okay? And the same here, again, it's in between zero and one. So I don't know what it is exactly, but I could guess. I'm, asked, I'm letting you know this because when you see the graphs in your homework, you're not going to have this dot and that dot. They're not going to be there, okay? You're going to have to figure out what those Y values and those X values are. They'll have this dot at the very beginning and that dot at the very end, but they won't have any other points identified, okay? And so you will be able, you will have to look and see what's the Y value and then find those X values that can be there, okay? Definitely, definitely, definitely. If you don't see it, you need to text me. 
this is just explaining everything we just did. Okay, now we can talk about this word that I don't like, um, zeros. It says zeros of a function. If the graph of a function has an x-intercept at a point, some number and zero, right? Then that number is called a zero of the function, okay? It doesn't mean that that number is the number zero, it just has a label called zero, okay? So that's why I don't like it, it's confusing a little bit, okay? I usually just say x-intercept, okay? I'd rather use x-intercept than zero because when the x-intercept is five, it just sounds counterintuitive to call five a zero, right? <laughs> but that's the mathematical way they say um, x-intercept. Also, if you take your function and you equal it to zero, um, a zero is the solution or solutions to f of x equal to zero, okay? So those x-intercepts, you find them by taking the function and equaling it to zero, okay? So here's some examples. It says find the zeros of each of this function. We now know that that means set it equal to zero and then just solve it. So they set part A equal to zero. Now I probably would have done quadratic formula just because I'm lazy and I don't want to sit there and think about how to factor it. But if you're awesome at factoring and you could do it real quick, then by all means go for it because it's faster if you know how to do it fast, okay? If you take too long to factor, you might as well just go into quadratic formula, okay? You get the same answers regardless. So once they factored it, they set each factor equal to zero and that's how they got these two answers. If I had done quadratic formula, I would have gotten these same two answers after doing the plus and then the minus, okay? So those two things are the x-intercepts that I know that, okay? Now for, they graphed it, not that we know how to graph, well, we should know how to graph quadratics by now, but, all it's saying is that if you were to graph it, notice that you have x-intercepts at those two numbers that you just found, okay? That's all it is. The word zero means x-intercept, okay? So for number two, that's what they had there for number two as our function. So they set that function equal to zero. They don't show you, but they did actually square both sides. And then that makes the house go away. And then zero squared is still zero. It looks like they went ahead and added over the x squared. And then they took the square root. But when you do take the square root, when you stick the root in there, you have to put that plus or minus, right? And so then they graphed what that would look like. Not that we would know what that looks like, but they graphed it for us. And they said, look, those two answers are where the x intercepts are. Okay? The last one, <clears throat> we have not talked about how to how to solve rational equations yet. We just haven't. That's the next, that's the last um, 314 unit is that rational expressions. This is in chapter two, so they're kind of assuming you've done it already, but it's not too bad as far as solving equations, okay? All they're saying is that if you had a fraction equal to zero, even when you were solving linear equations, how did you get rid of fractions? You multiplied everybody by the common denominator, right? And then all the fractions would just magically disappear, right? It's the same thing here. Multiply both sides by this denominator. And then what happens is those denominators go away and all you have is the numerator. But what's zero times anything? It's still zero, right? And so that's how they got this 2t minus 3. So once that denominator is out of the picture, it's not too bad, right? You just continue solving the linear equation. You add 3 over, you divide by 2, and now you get this solution here. So then that means you have a 0 or an x-intercept. Notice that the variable is not x, is it? It's t, right? So look at the word they used. t-intercept, right? 
Makes sense, right? It's not X, <laughs> it's T now. And then they graphed it for us, of course, and they're just saying, notice it's there, that number you found. Okay, so, so far, so good. We've already talked about two of those things, the vertical line test, which we had talked about before, and we've just now talked about the zeros. Now we're gonna get into the intervals of increasing and decreasing. The biggest thing that you need to understand about intervals of decreasing is that sometimes they give it away in the question and sometimes they don't. And so you have to know, okay? But when you're writing intervals of increasing and decreasing, you always say the word sometimes at the end on its domain. If they say that, they're trying to hint to you that trick that I mentioned at the very beginning of class, right? There's a trick, and once you know what that trick is to writing these intervals, you got it, okay? The trick is, is that I need to use domain values. Are domains X's or Y's? They're X's. So when I'm writing these intervals, I should only be using corresponding X values. Okay, so for instance, this graph, are they gonna tell me the answer on the other page? No, not really. Are they ever gonna get to a problem? Yeah, they will eventually. Okay, so I don't need to talk about it just yet. But also what you need to know is that you do need to be looking at the graph from left to right. And the reason I mentioned that is because people, if I put an arrow here, it confuses the heck out of everyone. Well, not everyone, but most people. Because they see this thing as going up because of the arrow, right? And to them, they're thinking, well, if it goes up, then that means it's increasing, doesn't it? But that's not true because when you're looking at these, you have to be looking at it from left to right. So if there's an arrow over here, it just means that I'm starting at somewhere way up there, okay? But as I move along the graph toward the right side, I am going downward, aren't I? And so that's why this region is actually decreasing and not increasing, even if there was an arrow, okay? Then from there to there, I'm just flatlining, aren't I? Okay, so that one's constant. The Y value is not changing. The Y value just remains constant, okay? And then here, if I'm going up, those Y values are doing what? They're going up as well, right? And so that's called increasing, okay? So always make sure that you're tracing it from left to right. That's a big thing there, okay? If you look at this going this way, you're not going left to right, are you? You started on the right and you're going leftward, backwards, the wrong way, okay? Always go from left to right. And then when you're trying to find those intervals of decreasing and increasing, make sure that you're transferring this onto the x-axis. So notice that this would have been the interval for which it's decreasing. And then from here, from here to here, and everything in between, would have been the interval in which it's constant. And then from here to here, this would have been the interval of which it's increasing. I'm not gonna write them, the intervals down. We are gonna have some examples in a little bit, okay? So this is just a mathematical way of saying increasing and decreasing. How do you tell the reader that you're looking at it from left to right? The way you tell them that is you tell them that you're looking at one X value that is on the left, right? Left means left, okay? So you're looking at one X value on the left and then another one on the right. Okay, and that's what's telling them, the reader, that you're, look, that you're looking at the graph from left to right. This is how you say left to right mathematically, essentially. And then what happens to your Y values? Did your Y value get bigger? Or did your Y value get smaller? Or did your Y value stay the same? Okay, that's all that that's saying. So if the first Y value is smaller than the second Y value, that means it got bigger. So it's increasing. 
if the first x value is bigger than the second x, or if the first y value is bigger than the second y value, that means it's decreasing. And then if both of the y values are the same, that means that it's constant. Okay, this is just in math language. So for us, we have to have a graph in order to tell whether or not, because it's saying that in order for you to decide whether a function is increasing, decreasing, or constant on an interval, you can evaluate that function for several values of x. But in order to know that you actually have the right answer, like you know all the x values from beginning to end, you would have to be plugging in a lot of different things, a lot of different things, okay? And if you don't plug enough different things, you could make the wrong conclusion, okay? So we're never gonna actually try to figure out whether a function is increasing or decreasing without a graph. We will always have a graph for now, okay? When you get to calculus, that's when you can just look at the function and be able to do something to it and tell me the intervals of increasing without ever having to see a graph, okay? That's not so calculus though. Not yet. So it says for us, in order to do it, we will study the technique of finding the exact point at which a second degree polynomial has a relative max. We did this in chapter three. 3.1, we talked about that. This exact point where a second degree, what the heck is second degree? Second degree means quadratic. The highest power is two, okay? So that exact point we talked about in 3.1, it's called the vertex, right? Whether the parabola is opening upward like this, that's the vertex. If the parabola is opening downward like that, that's the vertex, right? And we talked about that if the parabola is opening upward, this vertex is actually a minimum, okay? And if it's opening downward, then that vertex is actually a maximum. Okay, so we did talk about that in 3.1. Other than with quadratics, you don't know how to do this just yet. In calculus, you will. You could have a polynomial with the 10th power and you'll be able to algebraically tell me where all the peaks are and all the valleys are, okay? Not us, not yet, <laughs> okay? We're not there yet. We will have some guesses, but that's the only way we can do it in, in algebra so far. But we can learn some other bits of information um, until we get to that big stuff. You have to know how to do the derivative. We talked about that quotient, what was it called? The difference quotient. Remember that from the other class on Tuesday? It was this thing. Remember that? Okay. That you need to know how to take the find a derivative, and derivatives are what you use to find those um, maximums and minimums, and where you what you use to find the uh, intervals of increasing and decreasing, and all of that. So those derivatives are going to be super important later, but just not to a couple classes from now. So for us, it says they want us to describe the increasing, decreasing, or constant behavior of each function. So we've got three different ones, okay? They're gonna put it in words, but I want us to practice already how to write it in interval notation because in your homework, you're gonna be asked to write it in interval notation, okay? Now, if there's no dots here or here, you need to assume that there are arrows. So if you're in WebAssign and you do not see a solid dot on the end or an open dot on the end, assume it's an arrow. Okay, now if I take this graph and I trace it from the very far left all the way to the right till I get to the end, tell me what it's doing. As I'm moving, what is it doing? Is it increasing, decreasing, or staying constant? And does it keep increasing? The whole way is increasing, right? So then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say it's increasing. Now here's the hard part. What is that interval? How far left does this thing go? 
Uh huh. So it's to negative infinity. And we already know those have parentheses, right? And then how far to the right does this go? Mm -hmm. It's going up faster than it is going to the right, but eventually, right, it will go to infinity. Okay. And then decreasing, there's nothing. I think, I don't know what they want you to write in the computer. I think you can select like whether or not it's decreasing or not decreasing, but I would say um, this symbol means there's no answer. And then constant is the same thing. There's no answer. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, next one does do some stuff, right? So that one is definitely going to have some different kinds of answers. So as I'm tracing, oh, there's no dot. I'm going to draw an arrow and an arrow. So as I start on the left, what is it doing? Mm -hmm. But once it gets to this spot, what does it start doing? Decreasing. So I need to figure out what the heck is going on over here first before I continue the rest of the graph. Okay. So it's increasing there. What is that interval? Negative infinity to negative one. Good. And what kind of symbol? Correct. Why are we picking brackets? You got it, solid dot. Okay, so now I can continue. From that dot, it's going, it's doing what? Decreasing until it gets to here, because then once it gets here, what is it doing? Increasing again. So now I need to figure out how do I tell them what's going on in this section, right? Okay, so that one is decreasing. And what is the interval for that section? Also, why did you pick negative one and not two? Mm -hmm. And we talked about that it has to be on the domain, right? So it has to be X values. Good. So what's the X value for this part? Uh-huh, negative one. And it's still solid, so it's still bracket. And then when does it stop decreasing? That positive one, and that's also a solid dot, right? So we'll put another bracket. But then from there, it's increasing again, isn't it? So from here, going in this direction, it's increasing, and it's increasing forever, right? So I'm going to put a union because there were two pieces, two parts where it was increasing, okay? And this one starts off at positive one and goes to the right forever, so it should be infinity. And it is a solid dot at one, so I should have a bracket, okay? Is it ever constant? It's like a flat line. No, so there's no interval for the constant. Okay, now without me scribbling all over everything, can you look at that one and tell me the interval in which it's increasing? You got it. And zero would have a parentheses or a bracket. Mm -hmm. And I actually need to go look up something real quick in just a second. Okay, what about constant? Zero to... What? Two. And again, solid dots, so we would have brackets. And then you have decreasing. Does it do that? Mm -hmm. And again, two would have a bracket. Now, here's where there's a dilemma. The book that I used to learn increasing, decreasing intervals used parentheses and brackets. However, the smarter you get, the more you realize how dumb you were, right? <laughs> and what happens is, is when you get to calculus, this changes. And I'll explain to you why. Once you learn the definition, the calculus definition of what makes something increase or decrease, 
you'll realize that you can never increase or decrease at a single spot, okay? So if you're standing in one spot, you cannot say that you're increasing or decreasing because you don't have anything you're comparing it to. You understand? I need two things in order to decide whether it's increasing or decreasing, right? So depending on what book you're using for algebra, sometimes they allow you to put the brackets and then some books are saying, no, you cannot put a bracket on negative one because you cannot actually increase or decrease or do anything at just negative one. So negative one should not be included in this interval that you're talking about, okay? And so what I want to bring to your attention is that sometimes in those um, directions that they give you, they talk about, they might say um, something like find the open intervals of the domain for which the function is increasing, decreasing, or constant, right? Now, if they say that word open, that means open dots only. Open dots correspond to what symbol? Parentheses. So if you see the word, then you are not allowed to use brackets in your intervals. It doesn't matter if there were solid dots there, okay? You're not allowed to put those brackets. Now I'm saying that because I don't remember if this textbook wants us to use brackets or parentheses. Yep, I knew it. And I should have known it because it's the same author as the calculus book. That's why we picked this book. This book was written by a guy named Larson. And when we went to calculus, we chose the same author, so you have to hear the same kind of voice if you were reading the book, okay? So in this book, they actually do only use open intervals. So what does that mean for us? That means when we go to type in our answers in WebAssign, we are not allowed to type in brackets for increasing, decreasing, and constant, okay? So these would not be my final, final answers, this would be the final answers, right? Parentheses only. And again, it has to do with that calculus argument, which is kind of a silly argument to have because we're not there yet, but it's the same guy. So of course he's gonna have the same opinion about this. There are a couple of things in math that are still debatable, believe it or not. The definition of a point is one of them. As interesting as that is and basic as it is, it's, it's just weird. Like there's mathematicians that think that points don't really exist, they're just math. Like we make them exist, it's not actual things. Especially when the definition they say is like, they say a linkless um, location indic indicator or something like that. Well, if it's linkless, that means there's nothing there, right? You'd have to be at least like a millimeter wide in order for you to be there, but it has no link whatsoever. So it's really weird. That whole concept is super weird. Okay. So last, last concept that we need to talk about here is the average rate of change. The average rate of change is just fancy way of saying slope, okay? So if you wanna find the average rate of change for two points, you just need to know the coordinates of those points and then you essentially just plug them into um, the slope formula, okay? So what you're doing when you do that is you're actually finding the slope of this like imaginary line right here, right? So if I had this point and this point and I tell you to find the average rate of change, if you draw a straight line from one point to the other, that line is called the secant line. In pre-cal, you'll know what secant means. And then in calculus, you'll actually learn some more stuff about that line. 
Okay, this is literally just a slope formula. It might look familiar, right? If you've done slope formula before. So I think in the past, when you were doing slope formula, you saw it like this, right? That's how you saw it. And instead of saying y2 and y1, they just use the fancy notation now. This is still saying the y value, the second y value, and this is still saying the first y value, okay? But if you're writing the slope formula by yourself, I don't care which notation you're using. As long as you're putting the right people in, that's all I care about, okay? So if we look at our first example, it says find the average rates of change for this function, but between these two points, and then later find the average rate of change between those two points, okay? So here's the first two points. They drew it for us. They didn't need to. I didn't need the graph at all to do what I need to do, right? I'm just trying to show it to you. So there's the two points. If you draw that little line that connects them, you're basically finding the slope of this line, okay? And then for part B, there's the two points they're talking about on the graph. They drew the little line that connects them and you'd be finding the slope of this line. Now this slope is going up, isn't it? Excuse me. So I can assume that I'm gonna get a positive answer for this one because it's a positive slope. And then that one, as I go left to right, it looks like it's going down, right? So this one should have a negative slope. Okay, so I already, that's kind of like a way you can kind of, if you had the graph, you could kind of know if your answer isn't going in the right direction, right? Okay, so let's do part A. <clears throat> now, I'm going to assume that I don't have this because I want you to know how to do the problem if you don't have the graph. We don't know how to graph these things yet, so we shouldn't have a graph, right? If I see this in the homework and there's no picture, how in the world do I do it, okay? I know that I need to find the slope, so I know I need to use this formula, but right now all I have is x2 and x1. How do you figure out y2 and y1 if you don't have this picture over here? Say again. Mm -hmm. Nothing to zero. But if I want to find the y value that belongs to this x value, this is the formula for it, isn't it? Isn't this saying? y equals x cubed minus 3x, right? In the new notation, but it is saying y equals that. So if I want to find out what the y are, I'm basically just going to plug in these numbers. So if I want to find y1, I'm plugging in negative 2. And if I want to find y2, I should be plugging in the negative 1. Now, what do I get here? I get eight plus six, which is 14. And then over here, I get one plus three, which is, oh no, I get negative eight plus six. So that's negative two. Over here, I get negative one plus three, which is positive two. And now that matches, right? Because didn't they have, these y values, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So y2 is 2 minus y1, which is a negative 2. Make sure you're putting the numbers in the right spots. That's what's super important. This becomes 2 plus 2. This becomes negative 1 plus 2 because of those double negatives. So we get 4 over 1 which is just four. And we did know that it should have been positive, right? So if you did those numbers wrong, you probably will end up with a negative and you'll know it's wrong. Now for part B, it's the same thing. I want to do this formula, but I can't yet because all I know is that X2 is one and X1 is zero. 
I don't know the Y values. Excuse me. So if I want to know the Y value for this guy, if I want to know Y1, I need to plug in zero. So zero cubed minus three times zero. And if I want to know the Y value for this X value, that would be Y2, I have to plug in the one. So for here, I get Y1 is just zero. And for here, I get Y2 is what? One minus three, so negative two. So now when I put them in the formula, the negative two goes in the front. There's the minus sign for the formula. And then the Y1 goes in the back. And I do end up with the negative slope, right? So you can find those Y values. You just have to actually go plug the X's in, right? To find the corresponding Y values. If they give you a picture, yay. But if they don't, no worries. Um, that's just the solution, same thing. Okay, here's a good one. Uh, see, does that word, right? Okay, they didn't say on the domain. See that you have to remember, okay? When you're doing increasing, decreasing, and constant, you're using X's, not Y's. So don't ever put negative 50, negative 36 in your answer at all. Okay. If I trace it from left to right, okay, does it increase anywhere? On this side, yes, from here, there, right? So how do you write that in an interval? From what X value to what X value? We know parentheses because of that word open. Even if the word open is not there, you have to know parentheses. Next is decreasing. Does this thing ever decrease? Remember you're tracing from left to right. Mm -hmm, on the left side. How do we write the left side in an interval? And we have to use parentheses. Now, what about constant? Do you see any flat lines anywhere in that graph? No flat lines. So that's when we say D and E does not exist. It's just not constant. And I want you to try this one. I'll pause the video. People are not waiting for us to work it out, but I want you to try it. Okay, did anybody get anything? Almost. I think. <laughs> anybody get anything different? 16? Yeah, I agree. You're right. Something I did. What did you get for Y1? Four? So you did this? Okay, what did you get for Y2? Okay, that's where we have an issue. Oh, I see what I did. I'll see R2. Negative 44. You are right. Yep, yep, yep. For some reason, I didn't put four right here. I used the same one from up there. So I don't know why did that put. <laughs> okay, but yes, in order for you, you know x1 is one, right? Tells you that. In order for you to find y1, you had to plug it all in, 
right? So we plugged it in everywhere there was an X. We did our computations and we figured out that it was four for Y1. Then X2 is four. So in order for us to find Y2, we had to plug in that four. And again, everywhere we see an X. I made an error and I didn't plug it in here. Okay, once we had that, then we did our computations and we got negative 44 for Y2. So I have to put everybody in the correct spots and I have to put these minuses in between. So Y2 was a negative 44, there's my minus. Y1 was a four. X2 was four, I have to put my minus, and then X1 was one. So when we did this computation, we got negative 48. That computation, we just got three. And then if you divide those, you do get that negative 16. Okay. So not too bad, not too bad. Now, I think that is the end of this section. We still have a lot of time. Oh my gosh, we're gonna have to go into the next one. Not that there's anything wrong with it. I just could not mentally prepare. <laughs> okay, so we do have time to go into the next section. Um, I actually would rather have it be like two different videos. So let me stop this recording and then I'll resume another recording. And we'll actually take a little bit of a break in between. Okay.